So we have a 59-year-old Hispanic male, and he comes to the emergency department complaining of chest pain. An electrocardiogram is obtained, and it shows ST segment elevation in the inferior leads. The patient is treated immediately. 48 hours later, which of the following sequelae is he most at risk for developing? So A, fibrinous pericarditis, B, pseudoaneurysm, C, mural thrombus, D, free wall rupture, or E, Dressler syndrome. So if you haven't already studied all of first aid or all of the review source and content that you're going to be looking through, you might not know what's going on here, but the key is what's highlighted in red. So you're told that an ECG, an electrocardiogram, shows ST segment elevation in the inferior leads. And that's just another way of saying that this patient is having a myocardial infarction, so a heart attack. And then within 48 hours, they're asking you what complication of a heart attack might you expect to see. So what this question is going after is where is the, you know, what evolution of the myocardial infarction might you see? And it's, in, it's very high yield, very important to understand that how, you know, how complications arise after a myocardial infarction over a two week period. Because depending on how far along that two week window you are, you can expect to see different complications, different evolution of the cardiac pathology, and that's caused by different pathophys. And both of those concepts, the, the pathology based on the timeline and the pathophysiology that leads to that pathology is incredibly high yield. And you could be asked different variations of something that you see here. So the first part of this question is to look at the timeline and figure out what complication you might see based on how far along we are. So in red, you see that we're 48 hours past the initial myocardial infarction. So you have to know what complication can you expect to find 48 hours later. Pause the video if you want some time to think about it. And if you're ready, here we go. The answer is fibrinous pericarditis, and fibrinous pericarditis is the evolution of the myocardial infarction that happens one to three days after the initial insult, after the initial myocardial infarction. Now let's go through B through E, and I'll tell you why those are the wrong answers. So for B and D, B is pseudoaneurysm, and D is free wall rupture, both of those complications will occur at three to 14 days after the initial myocardial infarction. For C, mural thrombus, and E, Dressler syndrome, these are both complications that occur at the two or more week mark. So in terms of how you can think about this mentally, you want to start to build this timeline and understand how things change over time. So the first part of this question, and there's going to be a second question on the next slide, is simply understanding the evolution of the myocardial infarction. Very, very high yield. And the high yield way of thinking here is to look at the question and pick out what's important. So again, the fact that they're telling you that there's ST segment elevation is their way of telling you that there's an MI. So as soon as you see that, your brain should start to, to churn and think, what could they possibly ask me about a myocardial infarction? And then they're, seeing, they're showing you that something's happening 48 hours later. So clearly this is a question about evolution of a myocardial infarction, and that's the direction that they're going in. Part two of the question, says, which of the following describes the pathophysiology responsible for the fibrinous pericarditis seen after this myocardial infarction? So this question is saying, what pathophysiology occurred to cause fibrinous pericarditis 48 hours after the myocardial infarction? So A, neutrophil-mediated coagulative necrosis. B, calcium-mediated myofibril hypercontraction. C, macrophage-mediated granulation tissue overlay. D, completion of the post-infarction scar tissue, or E, macrophage-mediated structural degradation. Pause the video if you'd like some time to think about it. And if you're ready, here we go. So the pathophysiology is actually the neutrophil-mediated coagulative necrosis. So that is what's responsible for causing fibrinous pericarditis because that neutrophilic, that neutrophilic substance is causing an inflammatory response which causes pericarditis. And remember that anything that ends with itis, I-T-I-S, itis means inflammation. And pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardial sac. And it's fibrinous because of this neutrophilic inflammatory cascade. Now let's go through B through E and talk about why those are not the right answers, and I'll tell you what they refer to.
So choice B, calcium-mediated myofibril hypercontraction, is what's responsible for the ventricular arrhythmia that you can see within 24 hours of a myocardial infarction. When you have the myofibrils that are pulling on each other and hypercontracting, it causes an arrhythmogenic response in the inherent cardiac tissue. So imagine if you held a microscope up to a heart and you zoomed all the way in on the myofibril. If you had myofibrils that were hypercontracting out of order and out of sync, that's to a larger extent, that's just the heart being in arrhythmia. And specifically, it's ventricular arrhythmia. And it's done, it happens because of too much calcium flowing in and causing the hypercontraction. So B is for the ventricular hyper uh, arrhythmia because of myofibril hypercontraction. C is macrophage-mediated granulation tissue overlay. And this is actually responsible for the free wall rupture. So when you put that granulation tissue down and you start to build your scar, you're actually acutely weakening the wall. And when that happens, you can rupture that wall. And that's what's responsible for the free wall rupture. D says completion of the post-infarction scar tissue, and that's responsible for a true mural thrombus. So when that post-infarction scar tissue gets laid down, it's really a nidus on which a thrombus can build, specifically in the mural area. So that is the pathophys for, the, for mural thrombus. And then E says macrophage-mediated structural degradation. This is very similar to choice C, but this one is actually the interventricular septum specifically. So when the structure of that septum gets broken down by macrophages, which are coming in again to kind of clean up an area that's been infarcted and chew up dead tissue and chew up debris, you can weaken that interventricular septum and rupture it. So these are the different pathophysiologies in blue, you see what they cause, and then you need to be able to correlate the pathophysiology to the cause, to the timeline. So what's the high yield bottom line? The takeaway from this question is what you see in this chart. It is very high yield to know the evolution of a myocardial infarction, which in layman's terms is what happens after a heart attack. Up to 24 hours, you get ventricular arrhythmia because of myofibril hypercontraction due to too much calcium. From one to three days, you get fibrinous pericarditis, which is inflammation of the pericardial sac because there's so many neutrophils that are acutely responding to the myocardial infarction. From three to 14 days, you get two things. One, a free wall rupture, and two, a left ventricular pseudoaneurysm. This is due to granulation tissue and macrophages coming into the area, trying to clean up the infarction, laying down the early granulation tissue, which will eventually form the scar. And then at two plus weeks, you can get the mural thrombus and Dressler syndrome. And these are due to the actual scar formation that forms two weeks after the myocardial infarction. So that's it. And I hope that this video was useful.